Again, we want to focus on a model that is intuitive, descriptive, and comprehensive, as Wilner uh, recommended. Uh, we're going to posit the LSC model that was introduced before. Basically, the yields or spot rates or spreads or whatever it is we're modeling can be modeled as a function of level. The intercept term slope, which is a function of a scalar and time to maturity and curvature, which is a complex function of the same parameters. The LSC model has the lowest quote average that is across the sample mean across the curve, absolute yield error according to research done by James Steely uh, when compared with splines, polynomials, Vasicek's model. And so this model has been well vetted in the academic literature. It fits curves very well. It leads to risk management decisions that are uh, tradable, and so it's easy and clear to know what to do if you have too much level exposure, slope exposure, or curvature exposure. And so the weighting, the level, applies the same weight across the entire curve. Slope applies the most weight on the short end of the curve, and curvature basically uh, applies the weight somewhere in the middle. Uh, that the peak point in the middle is, is roughly related to the scalar, although not exact. In this case, the scalar is 2. That peak point, I think, is a little north of 2, uh, but there it's closely related. <clears throat> and so as maturity goes to infinity, um, the yield becomes level. As it goes to 0, it becomes level plus slope. If the interest rate term structure is upward sloping, then the slope is measured as a negative. Spot rate factors greater than one measure the curvature. Uh, higher values lead to flatter slopes and lower values lead to steeper slopes. Um, the bond value today, the way we're going to do this is we're going to fit a base curve. Then we're going to fit a spread curve. We know this has some sort of error in it. Uh, the, the bond value later is we're going to model some changes in the LSC model, some changes in the uh, spread of the uh, uh, LSC model applied to spreads, uh, and then we're gonna we're gonna proxy the bond value later based on these parameters, um, and we can decompose the holding period return with continuous compounding into th uh, four component pieces: the horizon component, the spread component, the spot rate curve component, and the interaction term. Uh, the un the uh, horizon component is known today, and so the uh, we take that uh, basically out by looking at the unknown holding period return decomposition. Uh, with these decompositions, uh, the actual bond holding period return discreetly compounded uh, can be represented as just the change in the bond value divided by the bond value. The unknown component, the denominator is the uh, value of the portfolio after just the passage of time. The gain in the numerator is, is based on the uh, value of the bond portfolio after the passage of time. The, uh, the, the known component is the horizon component, and the, uh, the bond uh, horizon return um, is, is basically uh, given this way. And so... Uh, the base rate holding period return is assuming just changes in the base curve. The bond spread holding period return is assuming just changes in the spread, and the interaction term captures everything else. And so we can estimate, without getting into a lot of technical details, the factor durations, factor convexities, and factor cross convexities. Uh, and we can look at um, the changes in um, the factors themselves. And we basically can decompose the holding period return into return contributions. That is the return contribution um, uh, 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 based on factor duration, the return contribution based on factor convexity, and the return contribution based on factor cross convexities, same parameters with spreads, and then um, the cross um, uh, uh, convexities. And so the uh, return contributions, basically we have level slope and curvature uh, for factor duration, factor convexity, and factor cross convexities. And then we have the uh, spread curve, the same idea. 
and then we have um, the cross convexities. And so again, I want to emphasize that the goal here is not to model all of these out. The goal is to have the tools available to model as far out as you need to. I suspect no one's going to have to worry about the uh, cross convexity um, um, uh, and some of these details here. But it's good to know that you could if you had to. You can go as deep as you need to go. Uh, and so the goal is to eliminate as many return contributions as possible as they contribute very little. Uh, factor duration return contributions can be measured this way. Same idea with factor convexity return contributions, cross convexities uh, in the same way. And so uh, the factor duration of the level sloping curvature, the only thing that the changes here is the weighting scheme applied to slope and the weighting scheme applied to curvature. Uh, and so um, we have an easy and direct way to calculate factor durations for level slope and curvatures. Uh, and we can actually model this out. Level duration and modified duration are exactly the same thing. Therefore, you can't distinguish them on this chart. If we look at uh, modified durations for level slope and curvature, we see that we get different values depending on uh, the, the particular bonds that we're analyzing. But uh, level uh, duration is a much more significantly higher number. Slope and curvature are similar, but they are distinctly different. Uh, factor convexity is the same in general analysis, except for um, this is squared uh, and the weights are squared. And so again, we have factor con uh, level factor convexity is very high relative to slope and curvature. Hence, most likely you never have to worry about those uh, with cross convexities. When we run this analysis, if you'll notice that these numbers are in seven, you know, the range is zero to 700 with cross convexities is zero to 14. So basically these just don't matter that much. And so in summary, we've examined uh, the traditional bond risk measures. We've explored the role of compounding, reviewed selected empirical evidence, and introduced LSC-based bond risk measures based on holding period returns, and illustrated selected LSC applications. We turn now to examine some of the R code. We're going to take a real quick look at the R code for Module 7.2, Static Risk Measures for U.S. Treasuries. Uh, there, there are three different test programs. If you'll notice down here in the, in, under the files, we have the traditional um, modified duration and convexity kind of test. We'll do an analysis of holding period returns and then also the spread over uh, CMT uh, test. And, and so um, as far as the traditional measure, we source in um, the U.S. the static risk measures U.S. Treasury functions. This is found. Um, this is a very similar file that we had before, but this file has been appended to include um, uh, modified duration as well as Macaulay's duration, uh, standard convexity, effective duration, and effective convexity. So when this particular program is run. Um, we, it basically computes a lot of these graphs I've commented out, but it computes the uh, traditional uh, uh, valuation parameters that we did before and then supplements that with various uh, duration measures as well as convexity measures. And the effective duration and modified duration should be the same because there's no, no cash flow effects and the same is true with convexity and we're confirming that that is in fact the case. Now, um, the, the second particular application is looking at the entire U.S. Treasury book and its spread over treasuries. This program will take a little while to run, uh, but basically we'll evaluate the entire uh, 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 treasury book based on uh, CMT and then evaluate how well uh, the constant maturity treasury rates explain um, the actual observed uh, treasury rates. And then the, uh, the, this uh, final test program examines the uh, book holding period returns from which the graphs and the presentation were given. And it basically allows you to go into a much richer set of um, 
risk measures besides just duration and convexity. You can do cross duration. You can um, do uh, slope and level uh, durations and convexities and uh, issues like that. So if you find yourself in need of advancing your quantitative skills within the debt market, this particular piece of pieces of R code uh, may prove helpful for your needs. Uh, and I would encourage you to delve into them. Uh, I'm sure that you could advance them much further than what I've done, uh, particularly if you're applying this to real world problems.